we're going to start a journey today and we hope that you'll stay with us on this journey. Um, we realize there'll be some Sundays you won't be here, that's fine, but stay on the journey. Uh, dip in and out as you can and uh, we're going to go through a journey in the Bible looking at people. There'll be a lot of emphasis on people this year, not so much themes in the Bible and books of the Bible and topics, but people and how they encountered God. Uh, and as we go through this journey, our goal is not just to learn about them, but is to learn about ourselves, to find ourselves in the stories of these people who experience God. And our prayer uh, as a teaching group is there'll be lots of little, um, what we call light bulb moments, lots of little moments where you go, ooh, yeah, I can relate to that. Um, I can relate to that person. I can relate to that experience that they went through. That's our prayer. And that God will change us through this. Because, as I say, life is a journey and this is a journey. Now, this morning, my challenge is to kind of try to compress what could be four sermons into one. Uh, next week, we've got our, our Vision Sunday. And in a couple of weeks' time, Sarah McKean, one of our church members who works for our church and heads up our food bank ministry, is going to uh, teach us about Abraham. Uh, which comes around Genesis 12. So I want to do the backdrop for, for the whole journey that we're going to go on, because really with Abraham, things all start to change. That's where people really start to encounter God in a very meaningful way. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, I don't know if you have a favorite TV series or something that really interests you or that you love to go to. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, my wife discovered this program called This Is Us. This Is Us is a series which started back in 2016. Um, it's had several series, and uh, was so, she was so excited about it, she couldn't wait for the next one to, to, to come up. Um, this is a TV series which is about a family. It follows the lives of uh, three siblings, whose names are Kevin, Kate, and Randall. They're known as the big three, and it's about their relationship with their spouses and whatnot, and their parents, who were called Jack and Rebecca Pearson. It takes place mainly in the present, but there's lots of flashbacks. Flashbacks to when the kids were born and what they went through and all the different things they learned. And sometimes there's flash forwards where they think, wonder what's going to happen next year. Wonder what will happen in the direction of your life. Um, the, th the, the two of the kids, Kevin and Kate, were born in 1980 when their father, Jack, was 36. There was a third child who was stillborn. His name was Kyle. And when Jack's wife, Rebecca, was in hospital giving birth to triplets, one of whom died, they believed that they were meant to have three children, not two. And that day in the hospital, they saw this little boy who was an African-American boy called Randall who had been abandoned by his parents in a fire station. And someone had found Randall and brought him to the hospital. And Jack and Rebecca adopt this little boy and take him into their family and bring him up as though he was one of their own. And so it's a, it's a wonderful story. I've watched a few of them, not all of them. Kirsten has seen every single episode. And it really is a very inspiring series. It's, it's a feel-good series, and we need feel-good series. Because I don't know about you, but there's an awful lot on TV that's really depressing and really violent. And one of the reviews that was written about this series is as follows. It's a refreshing respite from the relational violence and pessimism that marks other soaps, that's soap opera stories, that have bubbled forth from a culture of divisiveness. So if you're feeling that our world is getting more and more divided, more and more violent, more and more pessimistic, check this out. It's really inspiring. But I say that to you because when you watch this, there's a lot of parallels with what we're going to do. We're going to do something similar. We're going to go have a lot of flashbacks into the Bible and stories of people in the Bible and how they encountered God and how it changed them. And sometimes there'll be flashbacks that go, if only we hadn't done that. <laughs> if only we hadn't gone down that road and gone down this road. If only we'd listened to what God was saying to us, things could have been changed. Or sometimes it's, thank God we went that way. 
like thank God that he's looking out for us. And so this series is really trying to capture the heart uh, of, of why we're here. In the New Testament, the book of Acts, this is my first reading today, Acts chapter 17. And Paul, the apostle, is talking to a whole group of people in Athens. Most of these people uh, do not know God in a personal way. They believe that there, some of them anyway, believe there could be a God. Some of them don't. Some of them are more what we call agnostics and say, well, if there is a God, we don't know if he's there or not. He might be there. What is God like? And this is what Paul says to them. So I'm going to, to read this to us today. Paul says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one person he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole world. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Notice that last sentence. Why are we here? Why do we live in the countries we live in? Why do we have the experiences that we have? Why, do, when we go all over the world, do we have similar questions? Why are we here so that we would seek him? God did this, that we would seek him, reach out for him, and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. I think that's a great summary of the Bible and this series and life in general. So let's start our journey. In the beginning of the Bible, there are four big stories. And I'm going to touch on these stories this morning, but I want you to use your imagination. Um, most Bible scholars believe that these stories evolved over a long period of time. As fathers and mothers would sit down with their kids and talk to their kids when their kids had questions. Dad, why are we here? Mom, what's life all about? Dad, why did Tim hit me this week? Um, Mom, why did Christina not share her lunch with me the other day? Why, why are people fighting one another in Ukraine? Why, 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 why? Lots of questions. And what the parents did, and these Jewish parents, is they would sit down with their kids and they would tell them stories. And kids love stories because when you tell a story, to a child, but to anyone, probably like this is us, you enter into that story and the characters in that story, and you go, yeah, that makes sense. In the beginning of the Bible, there are four stories. Um, and we have to remember that these are stories. Okay, we get lost in all sorts of weird imaginations and debates over these stories. Because what we try to do is, we try to read these stories in today's world from today's um, perspective. And they were written in a completely different time. I, I remember when I first became a Christian, I, I was in a Christian bookshop in Belfast. And I saw this book. <laughs> the book was called Noah's Ark Discovered. I went, whoa, I'll buy that book. And I put the book, bought it home. And it was a book about this American... Uh, person who dis find, decided that he had found Noah's Ark. And all it was was a picture of like, a, 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 like something in a ground, nothing else than that. And the whole book was about whether or not we could find Noah's Ark, whether or not there was wood on a mountain somewhere in eastern Turkey. And you go, that's not the point of the story. And I could, there's all kinds of things in these four stories about talking snakes, about men who live for 969 years, about angels who come to heaven and have sex with women. I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff in these stories that we can, if we get into all of those sort of things and people building a tower, think, whoa, what's all that about? They are stories to try particularly to teach children and young people important moral lessons for life. And as I go through them this morning, I want you to go with me in that. You may disagree with me in that, 
But that's how I view them, having years of read these stories. And they're stories that we can find ourselves in. So stay with me on the journey. Give me a bit of grace. And if I upset you this morning, send me an email. And we'll have a coffee and we'll have a chat. Okay. So the little boy's sitting down with his dad. And he says, Dad, what's wrong with me? There's just something not right with me. And I said, what do you mean there's something not right with you? He said, I don't know. I just, I get all these bad thoughts in my head. And I want to do things. And I know you tell me they're wrong, but I can't help it. I just end up doing things that I know are wrong. And can I say that it's okay? I quite enjoy it sometimes. And then I feel guilty. Like, what's wrong? Why do I feel like that? Or maybe it's a conversation like this. His dad, like, what's wrong with me? He said, what do you mean, what's wrong? He says, do you know all these things that you tell me to do to help people? He says, there's lots of times I just can't be bothered. I know I should do it, but I don't do the things that I really should do. Why do I not help people the way I should? Dad, what's wrong with me? Sit down and let me tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a man and a woman in a garden. A little boy sits down. He listens to his dad telling this story about a lovely garden. And in this garden, there were, was a world. A whole world was outside this garden. And he says, listen, you know what this world that we live in? This is a good world, but it's not a perfect world. He says, if anybody ever tells you it was a perfect world, that's wrong doesn't tell us that. God doesn't tell us he made a perfect world. And if people say that, they're not reading the story correctly. He never said it was perfect. He said it was good. It's got potential, but God wants to give us the freedom to develop that potential for ourselves. So he says, we live in a good world, okay, that's got lots of potential. He said, in this world, there's lots of animals. He says, what's your favorite animal? Oh, he says, I like um, horses. Uh, and I like dogs. He says, is there any kind of animal that you don't like? Oh, yes, Dad. What do you not like? Snakes. So what? Yeah. He says, Dad, I don't know anyone. Well, maybe the odd pop star. Okay, I don't really know many people who like snakes. I said, Dad, why do people not like snakes? Good question. Okay, in this garden, there was a snake, okay? It was a talking snake. A talking snake? Yeah. Just imagine a slithery big snake comes into the garden, and there were people by this time in the garden, and the snake starts to talk to them. He said, Dad, I would never listen to a talking snake. He said, well, not good for you, but these people did. And he said, well, what was that all about? What did the snake say to them? He says, well, I want you to imagine that this snake told them that God didn't love them. Really? Yeah. And he started putting doubts in their mind that there was a good God who really loved them and wanted the best for them. Wow. And then he said something else to them. What did he say, Dad? He said, why don't you just kind of do it yourself? I mean, God isn't really bothered with you anymore. He's not really interested in you, so you're by yourself. Just go and make the best of it. Dad, what did they do? They listened to the voice. Oh my goodness, what happened? He says, things started to go badly wrong. They started actually believing that God didn't love them and that they were better off themselves. And what happened? They started listening to the wrong voices. He said, Dad... I think that's what I've been doing. I think that's what's happening to me. He said, you see all these things that I do wrong? He said, it's like, Dad, there's a little voice in my head saying, do it, take it, hit him, get your own back. He said, I can relate to that. Do you think that's what happened to them? Dad says, yeah, I think it is. They listened to their own voices and they started doing things their own way rather than God's way. Wow. And what happened at the end of that first story, Dad? Well, they discovered that there's something wrong with them. There's something broken inside them. And he says, you know what? It's the same in all of us. Really? Even you, Dad? <laughs> Even me. 
Okay, there's some, you may think I'm good dad. You may put me on a pedestal and follow me, but you know what? There's something broken inside me and her and him. And you know that kid at school that you really can't get along with and the things you do, them too. It's in all of us. We're all broken. Wow, that makes sense, doesn't it, Dad? It makes sense. Once upon a time in a garden, there was a man and a woman. See what happens, folks, when you tell Bible stories the way they're meant to be told? And I'm not saying about me, that when you get the point of these stories, rather than going off on tangents, we get into all sorts of confusion. Story number two. One day, the little boy comes home. And he goes, Dad, do you remember a few weeks ago you told me that really cool story about me? Yeah. Well, something happened in school this week. Okay, what happened? Well, he said, Dad, I don't really know how to tell this, but he said, there's a guy in my class, and I can't stand him. He bugs me. He's a bully. He bullies other people in our school. He goes after them. He talks about them. He trips them. He steals things from them. He says all sorts of lies about them behind them. But I just can't stand this guy. Dad, you know what? There's times like I want to kill him. Why do I want to do that, Dad? This is a bully, and I just don't like this guy. And if I could get my own back for him, I would do it. Should I just go and punch him, Dad? Is that what I should do? He says, let me tell you a story. Okay, sit down. <laughs> Once upon a time, there were two brothers in a field, and they were farmers. Both of them were farmers. One of them farmed crops, and one of them farmed animals. They were good at their job. Okay? And this is answering the question, not so much what's wrong with me, but what's wrong with him? What's wrong with us? Why do we just not get along together? And one day, the two brothers decided that they would bring God a gift. And they would say, thank you to God. It's in Genesis chapter 4. And their names were Cain and Abel. And farmers need rain, okay? And they need to know that their animals are going to give birth and reproduce and are going to be healthy animals. So I bet you farmers do a lot of praying. And when their prayers are answered, they're very grateful. Even in our society, in our culture, once a year, we have a thing called harvest. And I know maybe it's lost its spiritual connotation, but at harvest time, what do we do? We come together and we say, thank you to God. Okay? And there's parts of our world today been crying out and are not a lot to be thankful for. But when we do get it, we're grateful. So one of the brothers, he goes out and he goes, ooh, I haven't got as much wheat in my field as I thought I was going to get. So he goes out to the edge of his field and he grabs a bunch of his crops and he takes them in and he brings them to God and he puts them down and says, there you go, God. Thank you for giving me my harvest. And he brings a bunch of the crops and puts it on the table and then he goes away. Then the other brother, he thinks, gosh, God's been good to me. He goes out and he sees his sheep. And he goes and he looks over all his lambs and he goes, which is the, this one right here? And he grabs one of his lambs, the best one he had. And he looks at this lamb and he goes, you are, I was going to say perfect. <laughs> You're very good. Okay, no, no animals are perfect. You're a very good lamb. And he brings this lamb in. And he says, God, I am so grateful to you for blessing me with all of these animals and these sheep and these lambs. And he kills the lamb, and he offers it to God, saying, God, that's how grateful I am. I am giving you my best, not my leftovers. Wow, Dad, that's interesting. What happens? Well, do you know the first guy in the story? Yeah, he got very, very angry. He got very jealous. What he did was he gave God his leftovers, the other guy gave God his best, but he got jealous because God favored this guy over him. And he didn't like it. Didn't like it that God blessed him rather than him, even though God blessed both of them. God loved both of them, and God had provided equally for both, but he got jealous because God seemed to favor one over the other, not because he was better or because God just said, well, I like this guy. He saw his heart. God says, I like that. I like that because that is what I, why I made you to be generous and to give, not just to me, but to others. God said to this guy who felt jealousy, you need to be careful. He said, you know what? 
it's like there's a big beast outside your door. Genesis says, um, this beast is waiting to grab you, grab you and seize you. And if you're not careful, it'll grab you. And he didn't listen. What happened to that? Jealousy got the best of him. So when he got a chance, he was in a field one day, and he saw his brother, the brother that God loved. And he went after his brother, and he waited till it was the right moment, and he killed his brother. He killed his brother, Dad? His own brother? He killed his brother? And then what did he do? He buried him in the ground and pretended he didn't do it. Wow! Just because he was jealous, just because he was jealous, he killed his very own brother. And then God shows up, says, where's your brother? What did he say to God? He says, am I supposed to take care of my brother? Yeah, you are, because he's your younger brother. God says, I know where your brother is. He's calling me from the ground. And at the end of that story, the selfishness in this man started to spread to his children his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. And there's this story at the end of the story where God says, look how it spread. And he says, that's what's going on in your school. That's what's going on all over the place. There's, we're, we're meant to care for one another, to love one another, but we become bullies, we become selfish, we become jealous, and we take it out on one another. That's a sad story, but it's a true story. Then, uh, let's say a few months later, wee boy comes back. He goes, Dad, I'm really enjoying these stories. I've got another question for you. Um, I've just discovered that what's going on in our school seems to be going on all over the world. Okay, like when I turn on my TV, I see a lot of bad things happening in, in other places. And, and, and it's not just me and these. Lots of people are doing very bad things. What's wrong with people, Dad? What's wrong with people all over in other countries who don't grow up in my country? I thought maybe it was just us. It's not. But no matter where you go, I hear stories that are similar. He said, let me tell you a story. Okay, sit down. Once upon a time, there was a great flood. Incidentally, there was a great flood about three and a half thousand years ago that happened. And all the ancient cultures have got stories about this flood. So something happened. And the Bible puts a spin on it, makes it a bit more realistic about why it happened and what God was trying to teach us. So do you remember that other story I told you about the two brothers? Well, it kept spreading. And it kept spreading and it got so bad. Let me read to you how bad it became. He says, God saw how great the wickedness of human beings had become all over the earth. Every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart seemed to be evil all the time. The Lord was sorry that he had made human beings on the earth. His heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord says, I will have to wipe from the face of this earth the human race I've created, and with them animals, birds, and creatures that move along the ground, for I'm truly sorry that I have made them. Oh, Dad, what happened in that story? Well, he said, he said, there's all kinds of floods that happen in our world. And these are really bad, really destructive. But sometimes our selfishness gets so bad that it spreads and spreads and spreads, and we mess up our planet. And we mess up so badly that things start to go badly wrong. And we don't think it's our fault. Sometimes we, we think we can just do anything we want to this world that God has made and there'll be no effects, there'll be no consequences. But he says, when God made this world and he put us on this world, he put us on this world to take care of it. And when we don't take care of this world, even in little things or big things, the world has a way of telling us that we're messing up. And he says our selfishness can not just affect other boys and girls in school, but it can actually affect the rainfall, the rivers, the land. It can affect everything. Now, sometimes things happen to us that aren't our direct fault, and we have got a way to, to deal with it, but sometimes we even make that worse. 
You know, floods are going to come, but sometimes what we do make them worse. Wow, Dad. And is that all because of selfishness? He says, many times it is. We just don't care about our world that we live on. So he says, God's got a problem. God loves people so much, and because he made them in his image, but what's he got to do? Does God just step back and say, oh, blew it. Just let them get on with it. Let them kill themselves. Is that what God would do? He said, what would you do? What would you do if you saw someone at school and they were hurting others and hurting themselves? Would you say nothing? What would happen if you didn't say anything and you let that bully keep on doing what he's doing? He would hurt more people, Dad. Is it hard to go and tell on him? Yes, it's hard. But what can happen is that you save people from the bully. And maybe, just maybe, you change the bully's heart. God's got a dilemma. In this dilemma, does he do something? Does he let it keep going to teach a lesson? Or does he just intervene? God intervenes. And God tells the guy to build a boat. And he says, build this boat and invite people to get on the boat because something bad is going to happen. I don't want it to happen. I am allowing it to happen because I am a God who gives freedom to this world. But I have provided a way to save people because I love people. And do you know what? I even love animals. Did you realize that before? It wasn't just people, but animals. So bring them on the boat because when this terrible flood comes, I want to save people because that's what my heart is for. Even bad people, even people who don't know, believe in me, I still love them and I care for them so much. I want to get as many people as possible on that boat. The little boy goes to dad. What happens? They must have, they must have been desperate to get on the boat, dad. If only. If only. So what happens? How many people got on the boat, Dad? One family. You are kidding me. One family? Just one? What did the others do? They didn't believe the story. They didn't believe that bad things were going to happen. And what did the guy do who built the boat? He pleaded with them to come. Right till the very moment this terrible flood came. The boat, the, the, the boat was there. The door was open. And, and he, they wouldn't come. Dad, that is tragic. That is awful. Sometimes he says people just don't listen. And don't listen to the warning signs. But that's not where the story ended. How did the story end? Well, after this terrible flood, the, the man and his family and all the animals that he'd saved came out. They saw this beautiful rainbow. And they felt that God was saying to them, I'm really, really sad that I've done this. I'm going to give you a sign. When you see that sign, remember what happened, but remember I truly love you. I do not want these things to happen, but I'm giving you a sign to remember to take care of this world and everyone on this world because we all deserve a second chance. And finally, story number four. We're going to make it think. The wee boy comes back one last time. And it, it gets even bigger now. It's not just kind of different nations. It's like, you know what? <laughs> Everywhere he looks, people just seem to be kind of going their own way. Going their own way. And he says, Dad, why do people, despite all these warning signs, why do people still keep going their own way? Sit down. Got one more story to tell you. It's a story about a city and a tall tower. People one day decided they didn't, they wanted to get their own little piece of land on this earth, and they decided to build a city for themselves. And he says, take note of that word, son. It wasn't just a city, they wanted to build a city for themselves. They wanted a piece of land and to build something that nobody else would get near. And they put a big tower in the middle of the city to make sure that when anyone came to the city, they would tell them to clear off. You don't belong in our city. This is our city. It was so high, it went right up to the sky so that they could see all around them because it was their city and nobody else was going to get into their city apart from them. What happens? God came down. 
God came down to their city. He walked around their city. They saw them building their city and the big tower going up. And all the people outside who needed to get into the city, they wouldn't let them in the city. They kept them out. Wow. And some of these people were lonely and hurting and, and afraid. They wouldn't let them in their city. They kept them out of their city, okay, because they didn't care about other people, just their own little city. And God came down and he said, I don't like this. This is not how the world's supposed to be. I did not make the world for people to have their own little patch. And this is my little patch, and you stay out of my patch. And you go over there. This is my patch, and I'm going to keep it at all costs. No. By the way, you can't come to my city. You can't get into my country. You stay where you are and take care of yourself. God says, that's not the world that I made. We're supposed to reach out to help people when they're struggling. And then they said, well, we're not going to listen to God's message. We're going to do things our own way. So they kept on building their city and doing it their way. And then God confused them. And they got so confused that the city eventually was destroyed and they lost their city and the tower came tumbling down and they were forced to go. And what happened, Dad? They had to go out of their city to someone else's city to try to find help. Ooh, that's interesting. They wouldn't help people, but when they needed help, they went somewhere else. Yeah, and they keep on wandering. Friends, those are the four stories at the start of our Bible. They're great stories. They're true stories because they're true to human experience. And as I told those stories to you this morning, from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11, hopefully there's a lot of stuff that rings true to us. And as we go through this journey this year, we want to help you to do three things. We want to help you to encounter God, just like those people encountered God. A God who says, come to me. Don't run away from me. Don't plug your ears. Come to me. I want you to experience me. I want you to encounter me. Come to me and listen. Secondly, a God who wants to form us, a God who wants to change us. He doesn't say, come to me, now go and change yourself. Come to me and I'll change your heart. That's how I save people. I save the people of this world one person at a time. I change people's hearts. And when I change the heart, I change the person. When I change the person, I change the family. When I change the family, I change the community. When I change the community, I change the city. When I change the city, I change the world. One heart at a time. And thirdly, mission. Do you see what God does for you and what God speaks to you? Just go and just bless other people. Look for opportunities every day, every week, just to make a difference in this world and watch what God will do. Lord, thank you so much for your words. <laughs> the, we know that your word is inspired because when we tell these stories that have been told for thousands of years, they still ring true today. There's that ring of truth in every human heart that, that is just so relevant. And as we go on this journey, Lord, we pray that we would encounter you. We pray that we will be changed by you. And we pray that as we go, we'll go into our worlds, change people to make a difference and to live our lives the way you want us to live them. Amen.